evening things this week. Thursday there's the, the big di final dinner out on the lawn, so that will be here. And it's important that you're here Friday morning um, for the final presentations and your f certificates and, um, and the, uh, the formal closing of the course. But also we have um, tonight the third of our um, weekly guest lectures. And um, this time we have Professor Bianca de Stavala from uh, University College London on talking on multiple questions for multiple mediators. Um, so, welcome. Thanks. I'll see if I... Hello, and thank you very much for turning up here after <laughs> such a long day. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you here. I hope... Oh, this is my right. I hope I won't be very long. I'm aware there is a football match coming up. And there was one... I'm um, sorry about Switzerland. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Um, thank you also for inviting me to give this lecture. Do tell me if I'm moving the microphone around. I'm Italian, by the way, so I, I do this. And, <laughs> and the voice disappears. As you can see, the topic is uh, um, multiple mediators, but the topic being so complicated, I, I will start with a few comments about actually mediation analysis in a simpler setting. First of all, I want to justify why mediation analysis is important. It involves the study of, and the extent of which an effect of a putative causal uh, variable has on another and trying to explain how much that relationship is due to a pathway that uh, we are interested in. So for example, there's plenty of evidence um, uh, relating to maternal size, pre-pregnancy maternal size, and psychiatric disorder in adolescence, so that it's being suggested that such a relationship could also apply to eating disorders and eating disorder behavior. So that's the putative causal uh, question that I, I will discuss with you tonight. But in order to investigate this relationship further, we also want to, in, in, uh, with my collaborators at UCL, uh, who are uh, childhood psychiatrists, we're also interested in seeing whether such putative relationship can be explained through the way uh, a child grows uh, from early infancy to pre-puberty that may explain certain trajectories and certain behaviors later on in adolescence. So the, the aim is to explain causal mechanisms. And in some application, but obviously not all application of mediation analysis, the aim could also be to identify potential points of intervention. Obviously, in this setting, it may, may, may not be suitable because it's quite hard to um, devise interventions on, uh, on childhood size. But because this is uh, um, a, a, an evening, of, uh, and there have been weeks full of, uh, of football, I, I tried, I really wasted my whole morning this morning <laughs> trying to find an example to justify mediation analysis in the context of the World Cup. So I tried to examine, this plot shouldn't appear there straight away, but anyway, I wanted to study the relationship between football success of a nation and the happiness of a nation. So I, I have a sort of, let's say, uh, my causal question was a bit of a data dredging, but it's... Uh, um, so I, I, I downloaded the um, ring rankings uh, in, um, at the beginning of this year of the male soccer teams or, or football teams. And I also downloaded the happiness index just produced by a group at LSE uh, for 2018. So time-wise, the ranking precedes the happiness, at least as reported. And the plot down there, I don't know if you can read it, but it's a plot for the 10 countries that as of this morning were still uh, with a chance of winning. And on the oh, uh, x-axis, we have the ranking. So on the left-hand side, it's top ranking uh, is Brazil, followed by Belgium, France, and Switzerland. And on the y-axis is the happiness index. And you can see that the happiest as the Swiss, but not maybe exactly tonight. And going up with the Croatians and the Russians doing pretty bad, badly in terms of ranking. So I may, I may want to say, OK, I think there is a relationship, although you can see not that maybe not linear. But can it be explained by the performance of the female team ranking? Because as the male uh, 
are more successful, they may in induce a, a better appreciation of the pleasure of football, and more female will play, there will be more facilities, and, the more fa and, and it's the women really playing that may improve the happiness. So this is another mediation question. I'll come back to that at the end, because I've got some data there. So going back more seriously, uh, why mediation analysis? What a history of mediation analysis. It's been around a long time. Psychiatrists, psych uh, psychometricians, social scientists have used mediation analysis since the, day, the, the early 1900s. It's, it's been so formally more prominent in, that, in those sciences, especially in psychological studies. In epidemiology, up to recently, about up to 10 years ago, I always had a more sort of ad hoc procedure where certain uh, regression models have been fitted with and without mediators, and then some qualitative conclusions are drawn of whether the potential mediator, the putative mediator, actually is explaining some of the effect of the exposure. But there is a renewed interest, as you probably well know, and its renewed interest in epidemiology is linked to developments uh, in causal inference, and in particular in counterfactual-based causal inference. But just to sort of stress why one may not be satisfied with just using traditional methods. Those are generally based on path analysis, as uh, initially proposed by Saul Wright, as you can see, 1921, 1934. But these, uh, this consists of specifying a series of regression models, one for the outcome, one for the mediator or mediators, several for the mediators, and then the estimated regression parameters are combined according to certain rules, and direct and indirect effects are, are derived. But however, all of this is based on associational models. You start with the regression models, and then you say, you interpret those regression models. But I, I claim in, in, in today, and I've claimed in many uh, places, that mediation questions really are causal questions, because they try to understand mechanism. So reproducing my... my um, my diagram there, the original one, not the football one, if I want, I'm trying to explain the mechanism through which my putative causal relationship between maternal size and uh, eating disorder uh, operates. As I said, path analysis only deals with correlations and it does not acknowledge the fact that there is a causal question underlying this and does not re uh, sort of, ex it, traditionally those methods do not really dwell very much in thinking about confounders that may be at play as well as the mediators. These are counterfactual based approaches that have been developed since 2008 or so, or, or in fact early 2000s, so are simply an extension of these method, methods. They extend, they, they deal with some of their limitations, for example, to the limitation that you could only deal with the continuous outcomes and continuous mediators. But also, besides sort of being a generalization, they also they introduce greater formality. And with greater formality, they also allow you to think more carefully about the question at hand. However, there is a downside to greater formality, greater generalizability, or generality, I should say. These sort of advantages of greater formality make our lives much more difficult when there are multiple mediators. So after this long introduction, the top, what I'll try to present today to you are sort of a, 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 an illustration of the complexities that one meets when there is more than one mediator. And in real life, it's rare that we're only interested in one mediator. In, if you work in life course epidemiology, you're probably interested in a chain of mediators that will act through periods of life. And the example I will be using is on psychiatry. But before I go to the example, I just want to have a quick refresher on counterfactual-based mediation, because otherwise you won't be able to follow the details of, of the difficulties that I'll try to explain. So what is it about counterfactual-based causal inference? Well, effects in this field, in this, with this framework, are defined by comparing potential outcomes under different hypothetical interventions. So we want to compare what would have happened to this population had everybody been exposed to a certain level of exposure or had they been exposed to another level of exposure, or more simply, been exposed, all exposed versus none exposed. Obviously, no data will be available on, on these two scenarios. Only one world, one world is available to us. 
But the formality of thinking in those terms allows us then to see whether we can use the real data, the observed data, to derive what, we, what is our target of estimation. And very quickly, the notation used in this field is to use this potential outcome denoted by y, round bracket, 0, close bracket, and y, round bracket, 1, close bracket, 1, to indicate these potential outcomes under different levels of exposure. And they are all hypothetical level of exposure. It, it doesn't have to be a, a, a possible exposure, but it has, we can, it's a mental exercise. And according to certain assumptions, and I'm not going to go into it, we can also say, if, if, such, um, if, if our definition of exposure is clear enough and, and uh, uh, well defined, we can say that we have so, some of those potential outcomes are observed, therefore they're factual, whilst others will be counterfactual. Many people talk about potential outcome approach as opposed to counterfactual approach, and I'm not a philosopher, I can't really dwell on the distinctions between these two levels, but the reason why in mediation analysis we talk about counterfactual based instead of potential outcome based, because in mediation analysis we also talk about potential mediators. So it's a sort of, a, I'm using it as a general term not to, to just highlight the outcomes in the potential, because there are also potential mediators. So in this field, uh, once you have defined your potential outcome, you then define a target of estimation, for example, the total causal effect expressed as a mean difference would be the contrast of two expectations, one of all the potential outcome under one level of exposure, one under the other. Now, what happens in mediation analysis? What are the complications? Well, without, again, going into too many details, the effects here need to be compared not only in terms of counterfactual outcomes, uh, because we are, by thinking of mediation, we are thinking of a process, and the process involves, yes, the exposure, setting the exposure, but we'll also involve setting the mediator in some way. So we have to complicate our notation, introduce potential mediators, so M0 and M1, like before. But unfortunately, we also need to think of the joint impact of intervening on the exposure, intervening on the mediator, and the mediator may have alternative values depending on what level of exposure that mediator is um, so subjected to. So obviously this uh, is quite an easy uh, potential outcome to imagine. It's a potential outcome that one would occur if the exposure was set to zero, to non-exposure, and the mediator had been set to its potential value under non-exposure. And the same here. So there is a consistency between our, our setting of exposure and potential mediator. But down here you can see there is some sort of contrast, contradictory statement. How can you have... How can we imagine a potential outcome where the exposure is set to zero, but the mediator is set to a value under presence of exposure? And this has opened up huge discussions. I'm only just wanted to give you a feeling. But if you want to separate direct and indirect effect, in some circumstances, you may want to invoke these definitions. And I've already said some could be potentially be factual, but the, one, the two ones on the right could never be observed, not, not even in, a, in a, an experiment. Now again, last slide of technicalities before I go to my example. Given these tools that we have, the potential outcomes, the potential mediators, the nested potential outcomes where the mediator plays a role, we have a range of possible definition of direct and indirect effect corresponding to the one from path analysis. I'm listing two. I'm not giving you the details. It's only for information, in a way, that I'm giving you um, the first definition, the ones that initially were more popular, the natural, so-called natural direct and indirect effects with these acronyms. What they capture is the separation of the exposure effects that involves or does not involve the potential mediator. So the idea of direct and indirect. And this is the formal definition, but again, I'm not going to stress what really the details of it. The important thing is here, I say that natural direct effect, I'm presenting two examples with decreasing level of assumptions necessary for their identifications. So these are initially the most uh, popular, in, uh, there are applications of those, but they make much, uh, often unverifiable assumption and unjustifiable assumptions. So a new bunch of uh, definitions have come up, and they come under the long name 
randomized interventional analog natural effect. So don't scream. It's a, it's a terrible nomenclature, and the equations there are even more terrible. But the point is, the difference between the two is that the new version, so these are just a, a more relaxed version of the one above, where in the one above, we, as, we imagine, we, we think of intervening both on the exposure and the mediator at the individual level. With the second one, we imagine to a world where we intervene on the exposure, but we shift the distribution of the mediators according to certain um, values that uh, correspond to what would happen under exposure or not exposure. And this has the advantage that could occur, you could design a randomized trial where you shift the distribution of whatever your mediator is, the ranking of female play. We could shift it with investments in, uh, in managers, for example, without saying, oh, you will perform as well as uh, under more management status. So it, it, it's uh, the focus. I think these are winning, if, if, if you want my, my guess. And, and because they make fewer assumptions, also because they're realistic, gives you an idea of an intervention at the mediator level. And they, in fact, answer questions which are very relevant. Right, now, finally, I'll move on to multiple mediators. So all this depend was in, of, of relevance for a single mediator, the definitions I've given. Imagine now you want to examine two mediators, M1 and M2, not just one. Now, first comment. Unless the mediators act separately, as in this drawing, we are really in big trouble. Because as soon as one is related to the other, other with direction going from M1 to M2 or M2 to M1, it doesn't matter. As soon as this happens, we cannot identify natural effect. We cannot even use in traditional methods in the, present, in the presence of interactions on nonlinearity. So we, if this is what we are, want to study, we, we are in trouble. Even if they are separate, but there are interactions or some, be, for example, between the mediator and the exposure, again, we can't do anything with the tools we have so far. No natural effects, no traditional path analysis effect. It, uh, if you don't believe me, I'm happy to, to go into the details. So what is one to do if you have multiple mediators? Most of my work deals with this, and not with just two, as you will see, with plenty more. So, what, what is, uh, so in fact, this is my example. You can imagine life can be hard. So my example with my collaboration with uh, uh, Nadia Michali, a psychiatrist from UCL, concerns understanding pathways that may link maternal BMI to eating disorders behavior using the ALSPAC data. And what she really wanted to understand, whether the, once this relationship is established, and we still say it's a putative causal relationship because not a single study can be used to demonstrate causality, but let's say that we are happy to study that maternal BMI pre-pregnancy may have an impact through either a biological pathway through how the girl grows. This, this, this analysis concerns only girls. So it will be the growth in infancy, both in height and weight, later growth and leading to early or later puberty. So the, all this is sort of, let's call it biological pathway. And then we have an early environmental factor through measurements of maternal attitude to food. The details of the variables are here. And as you can see, uh, uh, the, the, the actual number of, uh, of mediators is large. It's not two. It's actually numerically eight. And I'm going only to show you the results for one particular outcome we, we have analyzed, but we've looked at many dimensions of eating disorder behavior. And this is for... Um, sorry, binge, binge scoring at age 13 as a, uh, from the ALSPAC study. We have just published results on a more complex analysis than the one I'm presenting with more details and greater characterization of maternal BMI. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm only talking about a binary version of maternal BMI, either overweight or obese or normal weight or underweight. So it's a, it's a binary exposure. But all these variables are actual the measurements at around age seven, uh, there's birth weight, height at seven, BMI at seven, height at 12, BMI at 12, pubertal status uh, according to standard score at age 12, uh, breast uh, development at age 12, 
and two-dimension of food, attitude to food from the mother. So I said, we are in trouble. None of the methods uh, we have used up to now will, will, will uh, do. But there are some sort of, the, the, the original question that was, can we separate really the two pathways cannot be addressed. But um, the reason why the title is multiple questions for multiple mediators, because it is that what we can do is to, ans to ask a bunch of questions. And together, because bits of questions on this, part, on, on this diagram, and together the, the answers may give us an idea of what pathway is dominant or not dominant. So there are four possible strategies that I can use, and uh, I will illustrate each of them in practice with, with numerically. So one way uh, that we can use, using the counterfactual based approach, not using the path analysis, is to treat all the eight mediators in block. So I just want to ask the question, is the relationship between exposure and outcome completely absorbed by these mediators? This is the joint effect. Or if there is a causal order, and uh, um, there is indeed a causal order in, in this variable, so the temporal order that allows me to assume a causal order, um, I, uh, we can do some sequential analysis uh, through uh, natural, just some of those paths, not all of them. So some specific path-specific effects. Or we can use this interventional effect, but as I said, have a future for multiple mediators. Or we can look at, look at a question in another way, looking at the time-varying natures of the mediators. So very quickly, um, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on the details, but all I, this slide says is I've got eight mediators. I call them uh, bold M, that's my new mediator, and then I use my usual tools for a single mediator. This is possible, and the definitions are here. Results. The question I can ask is, do all mediators combined lead to a null direct effect? In other words, can I explain the whole relationship through these eight mediators? First of all, let me explain the scale. So binge eating score uh, was derived from uh, some psychometric questionnaires and then standardized into a, a, a Z-score. So binge eating score it has mean zero and standard deviation one. Maternal BMI is binary. What the, this total causal effect is the, uh, the total relationship between exposure and outcome that says that if all mothers uh, were set to being overweight and obese. In a world where all mothers are said to be overweight and obese, and we can discuss whether this is a sensible thing to say, or versus all mothers being normal weight, the score, the binge score, will be 0.15 standard deviation higher in expectation. So we have a positive impact of BMI. And overall, it's quite substantive if you think of the standard deviation being one. So 15% of standard deviation uh, sort of associated with the uh, uh, higher uh, maternal body size. Can we separate what goes through these eight mediators and what does not go through the mediators? Obviously, the, what goes through, it's through all this possible pathway, excluding this. So in, obviously, this is my direct effect in the sense that it does not involve any of my mediators of interest. So about a, a third of the total effect goes through other pathways beside the ones I'm interested in, but two-thirds are explained, two-thirds of it is explained by my mediators. Next question, sequential mediator. Again, uh, I'm not giving you the details, but there is a way of doing sequentially, defining my, my, my high-dimensional high mediator, instead of being made of eight, being composed of a subset of the early mediator, and then making some comparison, I can derive um, what is via the earlier bunch of mediators and downstream, via the later mediators only, and via neither. So what I'm picking up here, so again, I have the same total causal effect, the same natural direct effect, assuming all my assumptions are met. And now I can say that the one that the indirect effect that involves M1, I call M1 the early life, and downstream, that means all these pathways that involve the blue um, boxes, the blue letters, except all those that involve the blue are one third 
of the total indirect? Well, two thirds are here, here, and here. So they're all the pathways that do not involve my early mediator. So now I can say, really, proportionately, um, no, I, I said it the other way around. Two thirds is through, two -third is through the, the early life, and one third involves only later development. Third approach, a generalization of interventional effect, here makes fa much fewer assumptions of no unmeasured confounding uh, uh, than in the previous one. So this is a more relaxed approach. I'm not, again, giving you the details, besides or the mathematical details, besides saying that I can, with this approach, using the same comp M1 and M2, the same bunch, bunches of mediators, I can separate the effect that involves the early mediator, but none of its descendants, only the later mediator, well, the mediators but not its descendants, and the one that does not involve either, plus some remainder. Better look at the numbers. Same total, same direct. Now, it's a different partitioning. I can now look at what involves the early mediators, but not the later ones, only upstream, which means this pathway and this pathway. So these are the two, and sorry, and this one, that count for hardly nothing. So very early life, or early infancy, or up to age seven, does not seem to have a separate pathway from what happens later, because the M2 and, up, and upstream means that I'm picking up all of this beside the ones that I've just excluded. And most of the indirect effect then involves puberty, really, the, 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 late, the late growth development, the, the prepubertal development seems to be more important. Final set of questions I can ask, uh, using some other developments in this field, rephrases the question and now ask the question, maybe I, should, I want to separate BMI from height, because at the moment I'm, I'm looking at periods of life instead of dimensions of growth. So I use this other approach, uh, and this allows me to separate the effect that if I call my mediators BMI and birth weight, what is, involves BMI, so the red lines would be my mediated effect, and the direct effect is anything that does not involve BMI, in a, with all the other um, variables, not depicted here for simplicity, but also at play. What are the results? I find that the, um, the here we have the, we, we can separate, now the, remember the direct effect now includes the impact of height, so it's not a mistake that the results are slightly different in terms of direct effect, but it, it, it's very interesting to see that the indirect effect is really l powered by BMI and birth weight. So these these trajectories of, of size as opposed to height seem to be dominant. So, summary of my four questions. I asked all these questions because I couldn't really separate, as I claimed at the beginning, each possible pathway. That's only possible within a, within a path analysis where incredibly strong parametric assumptions are made, which are not realistic here, when there is a combination of continuous and binary variables. So I ask this question, do all mediators combined explain the, the, the causal relationship? I find uh, two-thirds explain that relationship. Is it early or late? According to the two methods I used, which make different assumptions, I find that most of the effect really involves M2, M2 being the later adolescent and puberty effect. Next question, which aspect of growth? It turns out that really it's, it's BMI and birth weight that dominate again uh, together this explanation. So in summary, and hopefully not too late, yeah, we are doing okay. Dealing with multiple mediators involves additional complexities to those already faced with a single mediator of interest. Traditional approaches are extremely limited to, lead, to deal with such uh, settings. These new contributions from the counterfactual um, literature uh, give 
although it may not appear so, so, so clearly from the speed in which I presented, but give a more formalized, hygienic, clear way of thinking and posing the questions and identifying what you are really trying to measure. I didn't dwell on the limitation of uh, path analysis, which do not have this nice, um, clear way of posing the question. They just combine regression parameters through some intuitive um, definition, or, or instead of being first declaring, what am I after? What is a direct effect? What is an indirect effect? Interventional effects offer new po possibility, but this idea of shifting the whole distribution of the mediator instead of intervening on the mediators and setting it contrary to what you have set the exposure. So that the, there is a, although we are comparing alternative worlds and maybe the data are not sufficient to uh, clean, to, to be able to define those, um, to identify those potential outcomes, at least we are not pretending that we can identify nested counterfactuals where we set x to zero in, at the beginning and then set x to one for the mediator. So interventional effects certainly worth investing. But still I didn't answer all the questions I wanted to ask. Um, I've asked some questions, I have a feeling of what's going on, but, um, but that's the fact. A mediation analysis involves so many possible pathways, so many comparisons of alternative scenarios, that we should be more realistic, I think, and not try to do more than is possible, unless we are in a very, 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 very simple setting. And let me stress it once again, there are lots of papers in the psychometric literature where, where they do analyze multiple mediators and generally assumes there are uh, separate pathways, but it's very unrealistic to make such an assumption. Finally, do you want to know what's the contribution of female team ranking? Well, I got the answer. Do you <laughs> what, oops, what do you think? <laughs> so first I should describe the variables, the happiness index, Obviously, they are all ranks, so they go from one to two hundred. Um, the plots I showed you show positive relationship between uh, male ranking and happiness of the country, and maybe tonight England will raise uh, or not will go happier. Um, there is a positive association between male ranking and female ranking. So what do we find? That the total causal effect, <laughs> without controlling for any confounders, uh, so forgive me for that, um, is that a, a, uni a one unit increase, if we intervened and shifted the ranking by one unit, uh, oh, sorry, shifted, um, yes, we've shifted, so we put things worse. I, I should have phrased it in the other way around, but if you increase the ranking, that means in, in my uh, classification, putting you lower down in the ranking, because the ranking is one for top and 150 for last, it will increase overall your ranking of happiness by nearly another unit. So that's bad. But most of it <laughs> seems to go uh, via uh, the female ranking. So uh, it's, uh, if the men go down, it brings the women down, and the, the women going down makes everybody more unhappy. <laughs> Obviously, um, I know, I've stretched it, but I was trying to add some happiness here. So these are the references, and thank you very much, and good luck. <laughs>
um, I haven't really uh, said much, but if it would say that if you had a gene <laughs> that could uh, predict uh, your ranking, well, this is obviously this is. Let's look at a more serious example <laughs> where you can think of um, BMI, for example. Uh, let's see if I go at the start. Right, if you could uh, have a, a, a you know a gene that predicts. A strong, a strong instrument for childhood size and a strong inter, a, a instrument for maternal BMI, then you, you'll, you'll be safer that you are, you'll be more sure that you have dealt with the confoundings applying there. But multiple mediators, I, th I imagine, would be even worse, less likely that you find a gene that only acts through that mediator and not through others. So you'll have the pleiotropy problem even more. The, the problem is true even between exposure and mediator. Traditional path analysis, when you've got measurement error in your variables, it can make you lead to sort of radically different conclusions than if you didn't have yeah. measurement error. So I was just curious, um, how does measurement error affect the sorts of methods that, that you've presented today? Well, there are applications where, for, say for example, uh, we have used, uh, for, we have summarized childhood size with uh, random intercept and random slopes. So in a way, we have dealt with capturing the essence of childhood size through um, latent variables. That would be a way of dealing with measurement error. And then you, so you have a, your measurement model up here, but you still want to find the structural relationship among the variables, as in structural equation models, but with greater flexibility and but also greater difficulties. Well, the data we've used was the, uh, I didn't, again, I went a bit quickly, the ALSPAC birth cohort. So these are uh, prospective, uh, prospectively collected data. So who would agree on that one, one ultimately needs prospective data to... Well, it, it emphasis, uh, helps a lot, lot, especially in drawing your diagram and knowing that one variable is measured before the occurrence of the other. That certainly would help, yes. But, uh, but it, w it wouldn't preclude the use of other designs. Uh, to, to investigate mediation. You just have to be greater care in dealing with uh, the ordering of the variables, I think. <laughs> I, think I think you touched on that very briefly. Is that right? Do you want? Like, say we have three biomarkers. This is sort of a personal example. So <laughs> say or here you had three biomarkers that were all sort of related, I don't know, related to glucose levels, related to inflammation. And the question, is it better to deal with them together than to pick one and choose it as your mediator? Or I mean, what sort of strategy. Right, strategy do you do three different mediations? I know they don't probably add up to the same thing, but does that give you information that maybe you don't have to make these extra do assumptions you, about multiple mediators. So you say, I can use this microphone here, I think. Uh, are your biomarkers ordered in any way, or they're just correlated? Let's say they're all associated with inflammation. So, so they're all an, uh, measurement of an underlying dimension that you want to capture. So then there would be a case of measurement error, right. where you could include a, 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 your latent dimension that you want to capture as manifested by your biomarkers, and uh, there would be ways of dealing with it. Then it, or do this, like the joint analysis. Irene? Uh, Irene? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Bianca. Um, you've drawn one deck here, one diagram here, uh, but you could imagine that you may have had uh, three other uh, points in that. Yeah. And could that change the whole picture? Um, and how sensitive is uh, the analysis to how you uh, 
mm. conceptualize the problem. Well, I, I suppose if there are, so you're thinking of other mediators, there will be a play. At the yeah. moment, they all belong to the direct effect here. Mm -hmm. So my question does not involve them. So they, their contribution uh, is part of the, of, of the direct effect. But if you're thinking that I have some confounders obviously that are control for in the analysis, if you think of a measure confounding, Depending on whether I use natural effects or interventional effects, they, if, if there is a measure confounding, depending on where it's acting, it may bias the results. And interventional effects are far more robust. They don't require a measure conf the, the, the assumption of no one measure confounding among the mediators. That's the beauty of the international interventional effects. Yeah. Yes, Bianca, th thank you also for this very educational overview uh, about uh, very complex things. A little bit following up on what Irene asked, how do you actually construct the, the, this original drawing? Are all these arrows arrows for which you have data, or are they putative as arrows, or possible arrows, or what, what, no, what are they? Very, very fair point. Th this was a collaboration with a psychiatrist who really came to me with a question. She was really... She really wanted to study puberty. That was her original hypothesis. Uh, she said, I, I, I believe puberty is the factor that drives uh, the onset of uh, eating disorders, behavior, this is behavior. And then I started discussing with her, I said, about how can puberty, first of all, is only measured as a binary dimension, whether or not there is breast development at age 12. I said, but puberty is something more than that. So we started discussing high growth trajectories as proxy for puberty. So her hypothesis developed even before looking at the data. So I think, what did she mean by puberty? And then thinking of the confounders, what are the confounders of the right-hand side of the girl? The confounders are early growth. And then uh, because of the problems of intermediate confounding that I haven't really mentioned, you can't really <coughs> estimate what you wish to estimate when there are intermediate confounders. So we absorb them as a mediator, which is one strategy of saying, let's treat them. So you know very well that's... <laughs> so the, it's, it's, the answer is, no, is not satisfactory, but it's better <coughs> than not answering. It's better than doing structural equation or path analysis without thinking. And this is my message, I think. Or don't try, or, or let's not try. Uh, many people say, I don't want to touch mediation analysis. But then everybody's trying to say it, maybe at the end in the discussion of the paper. They want to say how this association can be explained, right? So it, we do it, we might as well be explicit, if we can. Sorry, Bianca, can I ask you to go to slide 22, just about the interpretation of the results? Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm using the wrong <laughs> computer, not just. <laughs> Sorry. It's probably a very basic question, but it's just about around the confidence intervals. This one? Oh, this one. This one. So the yeah. conf how do you interpret those confidence intervals? Uh, in the sense that one of them includes the zero? Or I, I don't take much notice of a confidence interval that just... Uh, yeah, I don't go by the P.05 as a, a, a threshold to judge whether something is worth reporting. I would say they are all... Practically, you know, there, there are signal. There is signal in the data for both a direct effect, even if it's, um, you know, in, this is practical. I could have rounded it to zero, couldn't I? <laughs> I'm just being honest here. Um, but there, all, there, there is a signal through in, in all three dimensions. Uh, you would discount that one? No, it's more the, the width of them. In that ah, the width. Oh. Like But it's still, it, these are units of standard deviation, so it's, it, it's not huge, you know, it, it's wide, but it's not, it's not enormous. The I, football is coming on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I clearly just enjoyed your talk a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one thing that we've started getting a little bit concerned about um, in some different things is that um, there's non-random attrition of the data over time. And I just wondered how much you're concerned about that kind of thing with, with these data? Well, we've used uh, single imputation with bootstrap standard errors to deal with the uh, attrition in the LSPAC data. So uh, assuming missing is at randoms, given the variables we've included in the imputation model. So if missing is given at random, do you know how sensitive the results are? 
Well, I think it's in any case you need to think of. Uh, I think that I, I, I trust the Alspac researchers when they say that uh, it's mostly driven by socioeconomic status, and there are plenty of measurements of maternal education, uh, occupation, which we use in, in imputation. But in general, uh, if, if, no, I, yeah, we we need, we need to be careful. True. Okay, I think that makes 45 minutes with four minutes of time added on because we had a problem with the laptop. So I'd like to thank Bianca again for the excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you.